So Jaffer, um, excellent uh, paper looking at some really novel techniques. I know that some of the electrosurgical techniques are becoming more mainstream, um, but how do we take what's in your paper and make it accessible to everyone? Uh, well, thanks, and thanks for doing this uh, with me, Kendra. It's, it's good fun. Um, I think a couple of things. So the paper is a review of transcatheter electrosurgery. The key takeaways, for me anyway, are, um, you know, you have all the tools available when you, you know, uh, in your surgeon hat rather than in your interventional hat. And as interventionists, we, we deploy devices that are tailor-made to specific anatomies, you know, but really we don't have the versatility that you have um, in terms of being able to cut and suture and, and mold and remodel. And I think transcatheter electrosurgery takes us one step closer to having this versatility. I've described um, three techniques in, in the paper, but really it's a, it's a toolkit that you can use and tailor to your patient and, and really create bespoke therapy. So I think that's the really exciting. And then the question of how do we make this more applicable? Well, the, the three procedures described were um, lampoon, basilica, and elastic or elastic therapy. And they're all uh, applicable in different scenarios and, and all currently relatively a little bit niche. And so let's take the one that's probably most commonly performed, which is Basilica. Um, and uh, only this weekend, uh, we presented the late breaking trial on the Basilica registry results, which actually showed really good outcomes. So 30 days, um, stroke was 2.8%, 0.5% was disabling, um, and uh, mortality 2.8%. So I think this is reassuring data for people who may have been a little bit skeptical to say, well, we're not quite sure about the, the safety of this procedure to take this procedure on. So I think one of the things is, is skepticism in the part of the community. And the second is the technical challenge to, to get there, right? The, the thing that surprises me is most of these people who say, oh, it's a little bit technically challenging, they all do CTOs, which, to be honest, is much more technically challenging than a basilica procedure, um, uh, involves many more steps, et cetera. So I think it's a question of getting the training in, getting appropriate proctoring, and getting a system to, to go forward. I mean, you know, what, what's your perspective on it? You do these procedures as well. Yeah. Well, I will say, just to take a step back, my initial um, exposure to electrosurgery, of course, was transcable. And coming from a surgeon's perspective, you were violating everything that I had learned in surgical training about planes and respecting the anatomy and all of that. And, you know, to use something as, um, as basic as crossing from one vessel to another, um, really, you know, all of those things that we learn in surgery don't necessarily apply. And so I, I think that once you wrap your head around the possibilities, then it's, a, it's about the techniques. And it's great to hear you say that you really believe that it's not any more challenging than a CTO. And I did listen to your presentations over the weekend and great results with the Basilica. Um, I, I think that this is going to become, you know, a even bigger problem as we get into valve and valves. But, you know, in terms of the devices available, you mentioned in the paper, the pachyderm catheters, those are no longer available. And so you're having to use off the shelf devices um, or, or shape your catheters on the back table. And I think that's, that's a stretch for many people to be able to do. Um, certainly um, the results are excellent. So you would hope that this would become something that your um, that was widely disseminated that your typical TAVR team would have in their armamentarium. Um, but um, I, I still tend to believe with what we have right now, this is kind of for those advanced centers, those high volume centers, um, when you're talking about Basilica. Um, but I want to transition to Lampoon. You described three different 
procedures and you know we do lampoon here at emory as well um you know what's your what's your take where is that most mostly going to be used where is this going to be most beneficial to the people out there that are trying to do you know valve and valve valve and ring valve and mac so at the moment most tmbr is with um tavi valves right and mostly with uh, sapien threes or sapien ultras and so and 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 so you need to do it in where you have anchoring which is valve and valve valve and ring and valve and max so this is this is the commonest area for the tmbr at the moment and of course lbot obstruction is a big problem and the three different tech techniques of lampoon have been iterated over time the first one was the classic retrograde am- lampoon where both your crossing and your snaring catheters come from the femoral arteries, crossing the aortic valve, loop around the mitral valve, either side of it, uh, cross it and, and, and lacerate. And the real advantage of that is you don't have to worry about the vector of your pull. It automatically lines you up with the LVOT. And so you always get a laceration um, in front of the LVOT. You don't have to worry about it. The challenge is the stability of the catheter positions. And so the next step was anti-grade lampoon where you go transeptal and you really have a lot more control from a transeptal position where your catheter positions are. And so it's seen from proctoring both procedures, people do find the anti-grade easier. It's easier to just teach. It's it's a shorter trip, actually. Um, and so I think this has led to some democratization of the procedure. Easier still, uh, and in fact, some operators have described it as technically trivial, which I think is probably true, is tip to base lampoon. And the reason it's fairly simple is it's just an uh, an arterial venous rail um, and with a kinked guide wire that you pull up towards from the tip of the mitral leaflet to the base. It does require specific anatomies to work. Um, so you need a backstop to prevent extension up into the left atrium, transverse sinus or aortic valve, all of which are structures that could be damaged if you're cutting upwards, right, from, from apex to base. Um, so complete rings and valve and valves. So I think that that is a procedure that 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 can be fairly easily done. And, and indeed, we proctored several remotely, um, you know, without even having to be there physically. So so I think I think a range of procedures for different anatomies. Um, and for me, the question is, where next, right? So we've got these procedures for valve and ring, valve and valve and valve and mag. What about TMVR with dedicated devices? Now, as you know better than I do, you know, most of these TMVR devices are fully covered, right? They don't have these open cells uh, to allow blood through. And talking to a few of the companies, they all said, well, while designing them, you know, we never thought we'd get rid of the anterior leaflet. So why not just cover the whole, the whole valve? So there are two, two strategies here. One is to say, well, let's, let's make our new generation valves compatible with the idea that we can get rid of the anterior leaflet like you do in surgery. Or... Um, so that's one line. And the second line is at the moment, we can still utilize Lampoon in cases of dynamic LVOT obstruction. So, so when you narrow the LVOT in the setting of a long anterior leaflet and you get SAM, we can still lacerate that leaflet to essentially split the sail to stop the Bernoulli forces dragging the leaflet across. So, um, so I guess that's the immediate future. And the question is, how do we marry this procedure with uh, dedicated TMVR devices. And it, it requires working together. Yes. And you bring up some really good points. I mean, much of what you describe, um, Basilica being the exception, um, is mimicking surgery, right? And so you would routinely split the anterior leaflet, um, but preserve the 
um, the chordal attachments to preserve the architecture of the LV. We certainly need to be thoughtful of that. Um, frankly, when I when I resect a segment of the anterior leaflet, although I'm I'm resecting a, a good portion of the segment uh, surgically. And so it's interesting that just the splitting and allowing it to splay to the sides is enough to get that same result. I agree the the new TMVR devices, um, you know, it's going to be a continued challenge and we're going to see this more and more where you have to be thoughtful of the CT scan planning identify those patients who are going to have a narrowed LVOT and then perform the leaflet splitting. Um, versus a rescue. And I think that a controlled pre-planned splitting is probably a much better idea than a rescue. Um, certainly want you to weigh in on that, as well as how are you working with the companies to have this become something that's mainstream? You know, who are, how are you getting this through that we can, we can put in more TMVRs than you think, because this isn't a limitation. In terms of working with the companies um, who design the TMVR devices, it's it's a question of you know so you you and I have done um, the so the the lampoon for Tendine and also the elastic in the setting of, of of Tendine and and really it's whether it's a priority for these people to capture all the people that they're missing with LVOT obstruction and redesign their valves. And it's probably, you know, they're not gonna change the valve now, it's gonna be the next generation of, of device, obviously. So, you know, they know that this is an option. I suppose one thing that will make it more palatable is if we stop using off-label guide wires and catheters to do this. So, so really what's incumbent on us at the moment is to uh, push forward the dedicated devices for this. And, uh, and you know, once we have on-label dedicated devices, they'll make the process easier, they'll make it more replicable, and they'll probably make it more palatable for the companies to, to marry it up with, with their valve design. Yeah. At the conference over the weekend, we saw dedicated devices to split um, aortic valve leaflets. Uh, do you think that that's where we're headed for the mitral as well, is that we will have a cutter or or something um, that's specifically designed for that? And, and where are you taking this electrosurgery in terms of device development, if you can give us a little glimpse into what the future may hold? Uh, I think I think cutters are, are great. Um, I think maybe slightly harder for the mitral because you have to it's a bit more tortuous, exactly, um, and uh, with the potential for, for added trauma. The nice thing about the transcatheter electrosurgery is everything is soft un until you press the bovi, in which case it becomes sharp, right? So I think it, it's more versatile and it can get to more places that way safely. But I think a, a, a cutter for, for the aortic valve when it's a relatively straight shot is certainly certainly great. And so I, I commend them for that. In terms of what devices for transcatheter electrosurgery in the pipeline, the general principles uh, are uh, you want to focus charge and you want to do it reliably. And you want the charge to focus on the structure that that you are going to cut. So, you know, the tools that we're designing and are designed to deliver energy to the leaflets without damaging alternate structures and to get there fairly easily and reproducibly. You know, at the moment we're scraping guide wires and flushing catheters and using catheters that aren't especially designed for the job. Um, so I think that's that that's the kind of that's the step. And you know, the the main transcatheter electrosurgery marketed device at the moment are the Bayless transeptal uh, needles and wires, right? And and that's it's a fairly neat and simple process. You know, it 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 requires just traversal rather than laceration. So you know, it's it's just charge on the tip of a wire to a relatively straight shot, but that's certainly a good predicate idea for, for everything else that we want to do. So 
looking at your paper and the the team out there that has never done anything electrosurgically um, outside of the preoperative planning with the CT scan and doing the analysis yourself, where would you say they start? I think the the easiest place to start with transcapital electrosurgery is transcable access or transeptal access. Even you know, just burn an astato through the septum. It's it's it, it actually makes the transeptal a lot easier than putting a needle in, and you get very familiar with the technique. You know, you you. The team is familiar, you know, they know where to attach the pads and, and to press the yellow button or the blue button, all this just little things that you don't want to be thinking about when you're doing something a bit more technically challenging. So, you know, they should go ahead and just do their next five transeptals by putting in a starter through the septum. Very simple, not problematic, and, and, you know, you actually get more maneuverability. Once you do that, then I think... Um, either a solo basilica uh, or a tip to base lampoon is, is a next good step to try. And then the slightly more advanced than that would be either an anti-grade lampoon or a, or a dopier basilica. And the thing to just keep in mind about the lampoon is often the most challenging and, and technically hard part is the TMVR afterwards, right? Especially if you're doing MAC or a, or a weirdly shaped ring rather than the lampoon procedure. So at least with the, uh, with Basilica, you, you know, you do the Basilica and then you just, <laughs> you just put in a valve. Right. Yeah. Well, with the Basilica also, um, I know that um, based on what you presented, the right side tends to be more challenging. Um, and that's certainly our experience here. It mm. takes a little long times to get the catheters where you want them to be. Um, and so in that progression of first practicing, you know, transeptal or some type of electrified wire technique, and then moving on, um, you know, I would say start with a left. Do you yeah. think that's necessary? Yeah, I, I think it's right. And I think particularly you want to know where you are and the fluoroscopic images for, for the right are very awkward and you can't always get there. So, you know, so that's that's one extra thing that 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 is not entirely clear. So I, I agree with you. Left left's uh, easier. Left left coronary arteries also obstruct more commonly. So, you know, it's it's just much more natural to get get the cadence of uh, of left basilica down before doing anything else. Right. And then what about Basilica for Tav and Tav, Redo Taver? Uh, so that's a great question. And of course, it's, um, you know, we've done some CT simulation work here with Toby is showing that with Tav and Tav and in some of these valves, obstruction, simulated obstruction risk is up to one in four, one in five of, of these. So a potential epidemic. Um, there are two things that make tab and tab different well let's say three things the first is the original commercial alignment of of the valve right so if um if the valve lands exactly as you would implant a valve then you know you're 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 at the first step if if the commissures are totally malaligned you know your central split along um that leaflet is not gonna not gonna benefit because it's not in front of the coronary artery the second thing is the cage um, of, of the transcapita valve probably limits some of the splay of that, of that leaflet. So when we uh, split the leaflet and then implant the new valve to push it out, um, that cage probably limits a little bit of that splay. And we showed some of this uh, on the bench top. And the third is that particularly the newer generation valves are designed with some redundant leaflet, which is why you can um, expand them, uh, over expand them a bit. And again, that redundant leaflet resists splay when, when you stretch it open. Uh, so, so for all these reasons, uh, it makes um, Basilica in Tav and Tav a little bit more challenging. However, having said all those sort of, um, sort of provisos, um, for STJ level obstruction, you, where you probably just need an adequate opening into the sinus, it may well be satisfactory. 
And the majority of obstructions for TAV and TAV is going to be at the level of the STJ. Right. Right. So the news isn't as bad as we think, but we really, we can't be blase about it. You know, a lot of things have to be right before you can do it. Well, this is really exciting work. Thank you so much for explaining to me and everyone um, more of the details on your paper. I, I look forward to seeing what's next. Great. Well, thank you so much. This is this was great. Thanks for this.